All right. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Wednesday night is normally dedicated to a Bible study, but tonight I'm going to be preaching more of a sermon that's geared towards the new year. You know, it's December 30th. Today we've got one more day left of the year, and we're starting a brand new year. And, um, you know, I'm not normally a big person on having a bunch of New Year's resolutions, but I don't have a problem with them either. And one of the things that I do always like to have set for us, and especially within the church, is goals for the church. So I wanted to take the time tonight to kind of reflect over what we've done in the past, what our goals were last year, because I set goals for our church last year, and we're setting goals again this year for our church, and we're going to see the things that we've done well, the things where we've kind of fell sh fallen short from, and we're going to learn from those things and move forward. Now, um, and I think that the new year is a great time to reflect on this stuff, because it's a new it's a, it's a new opportunity. It's like a new birth. We get, we get a chance to start over again. Hey, if we've done things that are, that are wrong in the past, we've kind of fallen short, we've failed at some things, let's get it right this time. Let's just pick ourselves up and keep moving and move forward. And that's how we treat the new year. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's some things that have happened this year. We, we haven't had, met the goals that I set forth last year, but that's okay. You know, I, I, I'm not ashamed of the goals that we set, and actually I'm setting the same exact goals that we had last year for this year. We've had a lot of, you know, I set goals for, for trying to gain new church members, for salvations, for, for baptisms, for all these different things. And um, I think they're important. I think we need to stay focused on these things because reaching other people with the gospel and, and, and getting baptized and, and making disciples is extremely important. That's why we're here. You know, we're here to, to, to help the community and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. So it's important to have these goals to stay focused. And if you remember, throughout the year, I've been bringing them up and trying to stay on task and trying to stay on plan. You know, we have a lot of fun activities. We have a fun activity tomorrow. And it's real easy to get caught up and distracted with these other events that go on and just kind of pretend like that's what church is all about, just coming around and get together, playing games and having fun. But that's actually not what it's all about. I mean, there's nothing wrong with fellowshipping and spending good Christian time together, but the whole point is to, is to do the work that God has laid out before us. We have very little time on this, on this earth. We need to spend it wisely and do the work that God has set before us to do. So over the, the past year, I'll start off with the successes. We've had plenty of successes this past year. There's been lots of good things that have happened. We've had some new church members that have come, some new families that have come just within 2015 alone. We, you see in the bulletin, we've had 90 people saved this year. Praise God for that. That's, that's, that's the result of a lot of hard work and a lot of effort and God blessing us. So I never, when we have even one soul saved for the year, it's not a failure. Now, I'll be honest with you, we had more souls saved last year. We had, I think, 103 was, was the total for last year. So the goal for this year was to get more than that. And we've fallen short. But I'm not going to say it's a failure. Because 90 souls trusted in Christ as their Savior this year from the efforts that we've done. Now, could we have done more? I don't know. We try to do more. But the, the thing is, the plan that I had for last year is a good plan. And that's why I'm maintaining that plan for next year. There was just some other things that, that, that didn't happen quite right. And actually, I've got, I'm, by the end of the sermon, I'm going to go over the plan where I'm gonna, that will hopefully improve our results for this year. There's a lot of things that I've learned this past year, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to teach those and incorporate those into the way we do our soul winning and following up with people. Now, um, I'm starting off here in Philippians chapter 3, just because there, it seems like you could say, man, you guys have been here for two years, but you're not that big of a church, you know, like, you, you could have a feeling, it's, it's easy to get a feeling of, of failure, a tendency to think like, well, what's going on here? How come, how come you're still so small? What, you know, what's the deal? And I'll tell you this, and, and I have this attitude, I'm going to maintain this attitude, and I don't care if, you know, I do care if this church doesn't grow, but it's not going to stop my mission, and it's not going to deter me from, from pastoring this church. And if, if we get smaller, we have to move back into the house, and so be it. That's where we're going to be. But I am not going to stop doing what I believe that God has me here to do. And hopefully we could reach as many people as possible. And regarding the failures, that's why I started off in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, of course, has the, the, the famous verse. 
In verse number 13, we'll start reading, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We need to keep on pressing forward. I'm not going get, to get sidetracked and, and get depressed and get you know, upset about this year and say, oh man, we've fallen short of our goals. We didn't get the baptisms we wanted. We didn't get the salvations we wanted. We didn't get all the church members that we wanted. It's easy to get, to get stuck in that, in that mentality and just think that, oh man, we're failing. We're not failing. We are going to stay focused on the things that are important, but we do, we do need to learn from the things we're, you know, that, have been, uh, that could be improved upon, and we're going to improve on those things. Now, we need to have this attitude that Paul had jump up real quick to verse number 11. Because he says here, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And he goes on talking about his works and, his, and following Christ. Now we know that salvation is by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. We know that, that he is already going to be resurrected because his faith is in Christ. But he says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let's keep reading. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend... That for which also I am apprehended of in Christ Jesus. So he's, what he's saying is, he's not considering himself to as already have, have attained you know, this, this great status of being worthy of the resurrection of Christ. But he knows he already has that coming. He's already a believer. It's already a done deal. But he, what he's trying to say here, he's, he's working in such a way that if it were possible for him to attain it by works, that's the way he's trying to live. So look at verse number 13. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. This is the type of mind that we need to have, that we're striving towards the prize for the mark of the high calling. And he says in verse 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are en the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that may be fashioned like in his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things in himself. So he's saying, look, I've warned you about these other people, even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of, of Christ, and these are the people who mind the earthly things. Their God is their belly. They're focused on the things of this world. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's easy to get distracted with these types of things, with just the pleasures of this earth and the pleasures of this world. We need to have our mind on heavenly things, on the things that are truly important for the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. Because as we strive to, to attain the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, as we try to be the best workers possible, as we go through this, as we go through the next year, it would be foolishness to think that things are just going to come really easily. We have to understand the reality of the work that we're doing. And I'll tell you what, if I didn't have this understanding... Prior to being ordained as a pastor, I would have failed already after two years. But I thank God that, that I was taught this before I came out and, and that I was actually had the opportunity to grow in a church that started very small, that started in a house just like ours did. And I was able to see the, the years and the time spent and the effort that was put in and, and in the short run, in the short term, not seeing the huge results. I remember being excited when we had a, an attendance of 26 people and just praising God that that was awesome. Like, we, man, we had 26 people in service. And that was, that was exciting. And that's about where we're at today. And that's exciting. And, and, and I thank God that he, that he allowed me to be a part of that church so that I could learn and grow so that when I get to the point to where I am today and where this church is today, 
I'm not discouraged. Would I like to have this room completely filled? Of course I would. But I'm not discouraged. I know that it takes time. I know that if you're going to do a great work for God, and I've already dedicated my life to serving the Lord. It's a lifelong thing. It's not a, a one-year, a two-year, a five-year job that I'm, that I'm holding. This is a lifelong commitment. And it's going to start off small, just like a little seed starts off tiny when you plant it into the ground. And it needs to be worked on. It needs to be nourished. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be watered. You need to do the work on the ground. You need to make sure everything's going right and put in a lot of effort for that to start to grow. And it's going to take some time for that to grow, but, but if you do put in all the hard work at the beginning, it will grow and have strong roots and a strong foundation. And that's what we're doing with this church. We're building a church that has, well, we're not even doing the building. God's building this church. We're doing the work that he set out for us. And I believe firmly that this church is going to be a solid, strong, Christ-honoring church that preaches the gospel to every creature in this whole surrounding area multiple times over. By the time we get to have the, the, you know, the growth that only time is going to give us, only God is going to give us. But we need to understand, especially in these early years, it's not going to be easy. And you know what? It's never going to be easy. No matter where you're at in your growth, the Christian life is never an easy thing to do. And I'm not saying that to discourage you, but we need to, to know this so that we can be prepared for what's to come ahead. Look at Luke chapter 13. And verse number 13, or excuse me, verse number 23. Luke 13, verse 23. The Bible says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. And shall not be able. So the disciples are asking Jesus, you know, are, are there only a few people that are saved? And his answer is basically yes, because he says, look, strive to enter in at the, the straight means narrow. And the reason why the gate is narrow, because it's only through Jesus Christ. We had someone ask me last week out soul winning, you know, um, well, do you, do you guys believe that, that yours, you know, your way is the only way to, to heaven? And she said that, like, it's, it, I said, well, it's only through Jesus Christ. She's like, so it's exclusive, only through Jesus. That none of these other religions, none of these other people. I said, yes. I said, exactly. That is what, and she didn't like that. She wants to think that, that everybody's going to heaven. Everyone's saying, but it's not. Look, many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. And she is a perfect example. She's going to seek to enter into heaven because who wouldn't? Everybody wants to get to heaven. But the way is narrow. It's only through Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that first and foremost. Hey, there are few that are saved. And the church that we're building is a church for believers. Now, we're going out and trying to bring the gospel. And, and you know, when you're talking about millions of people, we've got 90,000, you know, over probably 100,000 people in the, in the surrounding area here. Few is still tens of thousands of people. You know, they could still be few, can still have thousands of people. So it's not like it's, it's just this small number in this church here. But we have to keep that in mind that, um, you know, especially in this area, we're probably never going to be some huge mega church like a Joel Osteen, right? That's not going to happen. But, um, but I do believe that God is capable of building us and I, and I believe we will have a big church here. I do believe that we'll have a lot of people later on down the road. But um, it'll be as God sees fit. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 25. When once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. See, there may not be many that are saved. There may be a lot of uh, trials and tribulations and persecutions that you have to face as a church. As an individual, I know firsthand what it's like to have family members reject you and, and, you know, to not be welcome in their presence anymore 
for the sole fact of your faith, of what you believe. Not because you're just trying to cram it down their throat every single time you're around them. Not because of any other reason, but just for the fact because they know that your faith is in Jesus Christ and they know that, that what you stand for. And there is family that, that I've been, that we don't see anymore because of my faith. And it's not easy. I mean, it's not fun. It's not like you enjoy being separated, but at the same time, hey, I love God. I love Jesus. I love him more than, than, than my family. And that's what he expects for us. That's what he wants us to do. But it's not all a big downer, okay? So like the Christian life, he tells us these things. He tells us, he warns us about this. He says, look, there's not many that are saved. There's, there, you know, you're going to face persecutions. You're going to face trials and tribulations. But he tells us these things so that he could, so that he could warn us and just let us know, hey, this is going to happen. I don't want you to be shaken or stirred up or, or, or doubting and wondering. We'll say, I, I thought God was with me. Then why are these bad things happening to me? A lot of Christians, they don't realize that when you start living for Christ, you will get attacked. It will become more difficult. This church, for example, when, when, when you know, I made a stand about, about the homos and about, about the, the wicked lifestyle and because this world wants to embrace it and be tolerant to say, oh, it's just okay, you need to accept them, you need, you know, we don't believe that. We believe it's an abomination and that, that God ordained the death penalty on such a wicked act. And when you stand up for something like that today and, and the world catches wind of it, they're going to attack you. They're going to come after you. And it happened already in Israel. Even, even in the, 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 the small, the young existence of this church, we've already been attacked. Now, it's, it was a mild attack. But for people who don't realize it's going to happen, it can be a real big deal. It was a real big deal. I remember when, uh, before I was pastoring the church, with other family members saying, oh, I saw you on the news. I can't, you know, and they give you a real hard time because, you know, of course the media is going to spin things to make you look like the worst person in the world. I mean, the, the, there's like, yeah, you're like, you're going to this cult of this, this Adolf Hitler church where they hate everybody and just want everybody dead, you know, and this is the way that they'll spin it. And then, you know, like, your family sees this and be like, what in the world? I saw you going into that place. That's your church? And it's like, well, look, we have to understand that these attacks are going to happen. And the enemy is going to do what they can to try to get everybody against you. And there are going to be times where maybe people are going to be turning their back on you. But knowing that it's going to happen should strengthen you. Knowing that, that, hey, this is a possibility. This could happen. If I decide to follow Jesus Christ, I mean, look at Jesus Christ. Look, they, he's called the, the master of the house Beelzebub. They called Jesus Christ Satan. They had him put to death. They hated Jesus Christ, the world, by and large. The Jews, they hated him. They, they lied about him in order for him to be put to death. So if you're following Jesus and trying to, to live the way that he lived, what do you think they're going to try to do to you? He said, they called the master of the house Beelzebub. How much more are they that, that follow him? They're in his house. How much more are they going to call you names and, and try to destroy you? It's going to happen if you're doing what, you know, living the way that Jesus actually wants you to. So unfortunately, a lot of people aren't living the way and, and obeying God's commandments and, and, and trying to lead their life according to, to God's word. And they think they're these great Christians, but they're not facing any persecution. They're just like the world. You can't tell any difference between them. And they're not being persecuted whatsoever because they're not following Jesus Christ. He says, yea, and all, the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It happens when you start doing the right thing. But like I said, it's not all a big downer. It's just here to help you know that these things are going to happen. The Bible tells us the truth about all things. As I mentioned last Sunday, you know, I don't want anything held back from me and God doesn't hold anything back from us. He says, look, this is the way it is. This is the way things are going to be. But it doesn't mean that you just have to be sorrowful and sad going through this existence. No, you can rejoice and you can be happy. Because there's a lot to be joyful for. There's a lot to be happy about. And there's a lot of things that are positive. There's a lot of victories that we see all throughout the Bible for people who, who keep their faith in the Lord. For people who will just trust in God and not in their own flesh and not, not in their own wisdom. Now, just because our church seems small right now does not mean it's destined to stay that way. 
Think about Jesus Christ's own ministry just before his death. You know, all men forsook him. Everybody fled and ran away from him and left him all by himself. His, his ministry, his church had dwindled down to almost nothing. It had its ups and downs. He had people when he was preaching and he fed the masses, the 5,000, 3,000, a lot of people. And then there was times when, when people got offended at what he said. And they all took off. And he said even to his own 12 disciples, well, are you going to leave too? But go ahead. Because it didn't, you know, Jesus is going to preach the truth no matter what, whether people get offended or whether they love his preaching. In, in the good times and in the bad times, he was there to do a job. And that's what we're here to do as a church. We're going to do the work that God has set out before us. Now, sometimes, maybe, hey, maybe we're going to abound and things are going to be going great. And other times, maybe it'll dwindle down a little bit because people are going to get mad and upset and, and leave and, and get angry. But think about even after Jesus, even after a low point in Jesus' ministry, when everyone forsook him, look at Acts chapter 2. We see what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Huge increase in the church. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. In a very short period of time, it went from almost nobody, a very small group. And even, even after the resurrection of Christ, there was about 150 people you know, meeting together until the, the day of Pentecost here when there were 3,000 people got saved and baptized. And the church just started growing exponentially from there it, when, the, when the, the work was really being done and the apostles were going out and, and preaching the gospel and, start, you know, and the apostle Paul was going out and starting churches in different areas and, and people were believing it was a great time of excitement. And hey, I believe that we could have that time of excitement here still today. And we're going to do this work here in Prescott Valley. But see, right now, everything that we do has to be done by faith. Everything has to be done by faith. People can look at the work that you do and say, you can't preach like that and expect to have a bunch of people come and listen to you. They're going to think you're nuts. That's what the world's going to tell you. That's what, that's what the, the wisdom of the world is going to tell you. You say, there's no way you can do it. But we have to take it by faith and say, you know what? No. The Bible says so. Look, God says not to hold back, to spare not, to lift up thy voice like a trumpet and to show, their pe show those people their sin. This is the way that God has told us to, to do things. God said, you know, we're not going to add anything to his word. We're not going to remove anything from his word. We're going we're gonna to lay it out plain. And we're going we're gonna to shout from the rooftops what the Bible says and not be ashamed of it. But in order to, to do that and think that we're going to grow, it's going to come by faith. Because knowing that, that we're obeying and following in God's commandments, He is going to bless us for that. The past two years, they're not a failure. I'll let, the, you know, the naysayers, they could laugh, they could mock, they could say, oh yeah, you got, you're going nowhere. But that's not going to sidetrack me from where we're going. It's, and hopefully it won't sidetrack you either. You can let the people that care about the build, big buildings, if that's all they care about, they don't have to come to our church. That's fine. I just preached on Sunday, you know, which church, what, what, what church is, what, what is important, what are the important things to be looking for when you're deciding on a church? And no, the people that, that agree with, with, that, with that message, we'll welcome in, in here. And if people have other, other criteria, then they don't have to come here. That's just fine. But I have faith that God's going to build this church as he sees fit. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was Jesus Christ speaking unto Peter. Jesus said, I'm going to build this church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God has given a lot of power unto the church. He's given us his gospel to preach. Hey, the souls that, that get saved on this earth as a result of the preaching of God's word that we do, those souls are saved eternally. They have eternal life. That's, gonna, that's something that matters. That's something that we can do that's a, that's a big deal. Now, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28. It's going to be a shorter sermon tonight.
We're going to spend the last part of the sermon though going over this because this is really important. This is going to be our main goal for the year as a church. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not ditching anything. I think the goals that we had last year are good goals. And I'll tell you what the goals were for those of you that weren't here. The goals were to double everything that we've done. The baptisms that we had, I wanted double. The, the souls that were saved, I wanted double. The church members that we had, we had double. And the soul winners that we had actually going out and preaching the gospel, I wanted double them. Everything hinged, getting those types of numbers, try, trying to, to increase by that much, it all hinged on getting extra soul winners out on the field. Getting more people out and doing the work. You say, you wonder why... Um, the numbers we have this year are so cl they're really close to last year's numbers as far as how many souls we've won and stuff like that. It's because we still have the same amount of workers going out and doing the work. A one man, one, one or two people can only produce so much. There's only so much you can do. I mean, you can, you can give as much of your time as you can, but that's it. In order, in order to see really big results, we need to have more people. We need to have more laborers. You know, Jesus Christ said, the, the fields are white unto harvest. Pray ye the Lord, you know, the, the, uh, the Lord that will send laborers forth. And that's what we need. We need more laborers. But I'm going to take responsibility for, for not getting as many laborers. But it's okay because I've got another plan. And we'll go over this in just a second. Look at Matthew 28. We're going to see the great commission that Jesus Christ has given unto the church right before he ascended up in heaven. Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We've done a good job at, at winning souls to Christ. We've done a good job. I believe that firmly. We've, we've done a very good job with that. You know, we do a good job of, of being very clear with the gospel and explaining salvation and, and really taking the time and making sure that people understand that it's a free gift. Making sure that people understand that, hey, you can't lose your salvation because it's, an eternal, it's eternal life. It's forever. It's not based on how good you are. It's, it's a free gift. We do a good job of doing that. But what we're not doing as good of a job is... The baptizing and the teaching and the, you know, basically the discipling and, and, and bringing people along after they get saved to try to help them out and to teach them and to help them to grow as a, as a, as a Christian. So I spent some time talking to, to some of my friends that are pastors of other churches and I actually, I have this completely, all the credit's going to have to go to Roger Jimenez for this, the pastor of Verity, because this was, when he showed this to me, this is awesome. And I think this is going to revolutionize, honestly, I think this is going to do a, a big impact on our soul winning program here. When he showed this to me and he told me about this, I, I mean, it, 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 it excited me, to be honest with you. This has is, this is given me a, a new spirit for, for going out and winning souls because I know that this is going to work. And the reason why is because it's all centered or it's not this is just a piece of paper okay it's not, I'm not excited about a piece of paper everything that's on this piece of paper is is about investing time in the people that you win to Christ and and doing it in such a way that you could kind of keep track of it and make sure that you are dedicating the proper time that ought to be given to somebody and look I've got a crazy life right now I've got a lot of things going on with family and work and church and all this other stuff. And I'm trying to make everything work and fit. And sometimes I'm disorganized to my detriment and to the detriment of, of the soul winning and, and the, the job that I need to be doing. And I'm here trying to lead the way. And I'm showing you guys, when you come out soul winning with me, I'll teach you how to do this. But I've got a new method. And I believe that we will realize the goals that we have set forth for this year as a result of this one change that I'm going to add, this addition to the soul winning. And I've got a whole stack of these now printed up on the back, on the bookshelf. And this is going to be something that, that I'm going to require that we do when we go out soul winning as a church. I want everybody to have these cards. And what this is, it's a new believer follow-up card. It has on here the date that you first come in contact with the person. You give them the gospel. And this is all for people who actually receive Christ as their Savior. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. We're doing a good job with the soul winning. 
But we need to do better on the discipling and getting them in and getting them baptized and, and, and trying to have more of an impact on their life. Because let's face it, when someone first gets saved, this old flesh doesn't go away. You have a lot of other influences in your life that can cause you to go down the wrong path even after you're saved. Hey, praise the Lord that they're saved and going to heaven when they die. And that is the most important thing. But let's, let's continue with that. Let's keep going forward. So you have an opportunity here. You know, and, uh, first of all, let me say this. This card is designed for people, only for people who are actually showing interest in church. Because there are people that will be interested in getting saved. There will be people that will be interested in hearing the gospel and who will honestly put their faith in Jesus Christ. But they'll also honestly tell you that they're really not that interested in coming to church. And there are people that are like... And, and if they have that type of an attitude, you're going to be spinning your wheels, you know, going after that person. So... You know, we try to make the best use of our time. It's the same thing that we do, you know, when you try to give the gospel to somebody. If someone just doesn't want to hear what you have to say, you don't, we don't just continually, like, spend our time just like, no, wait, no, you just keep on trying to have a conversation with them. If they don't want to listen, that's fine. You know, their heart's not there. They're not going to be receptive anyways. So if people aren't going to be receptive to even saying they're interested in coming to a church service, we're not going to keep harassing them and going after them because you're just going to irritate them. You're just going to end up pushing them away. This is for people who actually say, well, yeah, you know what? I am kind of interested in coming to church. That does sound this like something I'd like to do. That's what this is, where this is going to come into play. Because what this has here, it has their name, address, you know, phone number, and then some notes about that person and things that happened there to help you remember. But on the back, it's got the date, places for a date for when they got saved. For when they get baptized so that you can follow up on these things. Remember, hey, this person's not baptized. And you can bring these things up to the person. It's got dates for phone calls, handwritten notes, and personal visits. Look, all of these things are important. For one, you know, the reason why we got soul winning, one of the reasons is because we care about people. You care about their souls. We don't want them going to hell when they die. We should also care about their growth and teaching them all things and them getting baptized. Those are things that we also should care about. When you write someone a handwritten note, not just something printed off the computer that, you, you know, it's like a, like a spam message that everybody gets. When you could write something personally to them, hey, that shows that you care about that person. And that's going to show, you know, even in your own heart, is going to make you care more for that person when you invest the time at home and say, you know, I've got all these things going on, but I'm going to make sure that I write this note to this person that just got saved. I'm thinking about them. I'm praying for them. When you do these things, that's going to show you're careful. When you make that phone call, pick up the phone and just say, hey, you know, how's it going? You know, we've got a church service. We've got an event coming up. We've got, you know, whatever. We've got these things coming up. Why, you know, how, how are things going? You can make these phone calls and then the personal visits. Now, one of the things that's on, and I love this, he's got the instructions on here too. We're going to use this as is, the, 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 completely. I, I copied word for word every single thing that's on here because I love every aspect of this. He has here, did you send a new believer's packet? Yes or no? Now we don't have, I will have the new believer's packets ready to go on Sunday. And what that's going to consist of just, is just going to be a, one of our DVDs and a preaching sermon and just a letter that, that's basically you know, welcoming them to come to the church, okay? And we could, we could modify that. And if there's things that you want to send that you think are important, hey, I think this sermon's great. You want to include that in there? Have at it. That's great. But we're going to have these new believer packets ready to go so that you could mail it to them. Now, when you mail that to them, automatically that gives you a really good reason to, to make a phone call to them later on. Because sometimes it could be a little awkward when you're calling someone. It's like, yeah, you talk to them at the door, but you kind of feel strange. Like, well, I mean, what am I going to say when I call this person up? When you send the new believer packet, you could be like, hey, I sent you a package. Did you get it? Very good reason to call somebody. And this is something that we're going to incorporate. Like I said, I'll have those on Sunday. But the instructions are listed there. And I, these are extremely important also. Number one, pray for your new convert every day for one week or during the time in which you're actively following up with them and, and, and you know, continuing communication with them. Pray for that person every day. Again, that's going to pray. I, I've mentioned this so many times in my sermons. You know, we are a church that believes that God is a God that answers prayer. 
And He's going to see our heart and our desire for that person. And you can pray specific things that you know, God will stir up their heart and that He'll teach them and, and, and He'll keep some bad influences away from them, that they can grow, that, that the seed that was planted, the new life that started in their, in their heart can continue to grow and pray for that person earnestly every day. Uh, instruction number two, attempt to fill in each one of the above boxes at least once before you move on. You know, because some people, you know, not everyone that you follow up with is going to end up, you know, coming into church and getting grounded and planted, and, you know, and, and everything and is going to want to continue talking to you. But some of them will. And the point is to try to at least do all of these things one time. At least one time before you just give up on that person and say, okay, well, yeah, they don't seem to want to have anything to do with us. You know, write them a note. Give them a phone call. Pay them a visit. If you can at least do those things one time, and you'll, you'll be able to tell. And obviously, you're going to use your, your, your discernment. So uh, number three says this. Use discretion and discernment in assessing their interest in coming to church. So ultimately, it's going to have to come down to some judgment on how you're going to use because we're not there to just, to just completely annoy people and, and, and bother them to the point to where they want to have, you know, they hear your church's name and they're going to be screaming running the other direction. That's not the point. We, the point is to, is to be an encouragement, to help them and to try to get them to grow and to come to church. Now, most people um, that I've followed up with have been very amiable. They've, they've been fine. They've been good. They don't have a problem. And, and even just last week on Sunday, I had someone saying, hey, you know, I you know, why don't you come back again? I'd like to talk to you about this more. When you see my truck here, I'm here. Come on over and, and talk to me. And there's a lot of people like that. Those are the types of people that's a very good idea to follow up with and to, and to continue a relationship, at least you know, as far as church goes, trying to get them to, to come in and, and, and be a visitor and care about these people. That all of these things you do, phone calls, handwritten notes, perfect, it sh you care about that person. And that's a, we ought to care about people. We ought to love people, especially when they're, when they're new, newborn babes in Christ. They just got saved. And I, for, if we can follow this and, and try your best to, to actually accomplish these things, I know that it'll, it'll, have, it'll have a good impact. Because these are the things that you need to do. It's that, that, that extra caring for people that is going to make the difference in the, the, the life and the growth of this church. And, and if you haven't noticed, you know, this church, we're all about, the lifeblood is about other people winning souls of Christ. Doing the work of, of God, standing firm on His words, not backing down, not making excuses for Him, preaching everything that's in the Bible, believing everything that's in the Bible, and living our life based on everything that's in the Bible, and also reaching the lost with the truth, with the light, with God's word, with the gospel, and trying to impact and, and see changes. And you know, one of the other successes that I've seen personally in this church is the, the, the changes that have, that have happened in people's lives that have been coming to church. And I know the changes that have been made in my life personally as a result of going to a good church. But you're not going to see those changes when you're out of church. So that's why it's important that once someone does get saved, to try to get them in. Say, look, you know, church is extremely important. We need to be trying our best to, to get these people to come in so that they can change their lives to, to be modeled after Christ and to be doing the things that are pleasing to God and get themselves out of sin. That's where we're going to see the, the magnificent wonders that God can do and the changes He can make in people's lives and the power through His Word and the impact they could have to change lives. So those are, those are the plans. So this year, I'm still planning, because last year I had better numbers. Our goal as a church is to double last year's numbers. That's our goal again for this year. I want to see, but the only way we're going to be able to do that is to get more people committed to winning souls to Christ. That, ha that has to be done. There's no way we can get more people saved with the same number of people going out and knocking doors. There's no way that we can get more people in here baptized if we don't have more people doing the work. And this is what the Christian life is all about anyways, preaching the gospel. And that's, that's the number one job that we have to do is to, to share the great news of that free gift with other people and, and have an impact on their souls eternally. Let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the free gift that you've given unto us, dear Lord. But help us to uh, be stirred up in our spirit. Help us to decide in this new year. Maybe you've never gone out soul winning before. Maybe you've never even tried to give the gospel to someone before. I pray that you would please help us, Lord, to, uh, if, if there's anyone in here that's been like that, that they would decide that this is going to be the year that they're going to they're going to try it. They're going to do it, dear Lord, that um, this will be the year that, that we know that, that it's so important to preach the gospel that we're going to put aside our own fears and doubts and just, just humbly do your work. God, for those of us who, who have done that, who have, who have preached your, your word and have won people to Christ, dear Lord, I pray that you would please stir us up to do even more. I pray that you would please help us to have the right heart towards the converts that we get, that we would focus more and invest more time in them, dear Lord, that we don't just quickly move on to the next person, but that we could invest a little bit more time and energy and effort into those that get saved, dear Lord, to help them to grow. And that you would, you would help us to devise, if, you know, I think this is a great way of doing it, Lord, help us to continue to improve our efforts, improve the, the, the soul winning methods that we have, dear Lord, help us to be able to, to be more clear and more understanding, dear Lord, uh, in, the, in our presentation of the gospel, and help us also just to to improve our methods and become more organized in getting um, in reaching people and teaching them uh, your word, dear God. And I pray that you would please just build this church. Help us to, to reach the lost and bring the people to us that, um, that honestly are seeking the truth, dear Lord, and that you would use us to do your work here in Prescott Valley. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.